Kitsap Literary Artists and Writers, Author and Creative Showcase on Bremerton Kitsap Access Television. I'm your host, Mark Miller. This week, I'd like to welcome Sheila. She's an author and thinker with some unique experiences. Sheila, welcome to the show. Thank you. We've known each other for a while. Thank you. Like I said, you and I have known each other for uh, a few years, and so we'll kind of start out with your book's name is Transsexualism and its Discontent. Do you want to talk a little bit about how you came up with that uh, title? It was meant to be an echo of Sigmund Freud's book, Civilization and Its Discontents. And what I wanted to get at was that I felt there had been a gap in transsexual literature and that there, it was formerly dominated by people who spoke for us. So we were hearing from psychologists, we were hearing from people uh, who would try to encapsulate our experience, but not from ourselves. So then, when we began writing, most of the, the genre that was coming out was autobiographies, and even they seemed to fall into a certain pattern of, this was my miserable former existence, then was transition, and then was the uh, happily ever after. And I thought that that was giving the wrong impression of the difficulty for transgender life courses. So I wanted to write a book from someone who'd been there and had seen it all and had read most of the literature uh, and explained that there's a lot of discontent, there's a lot of challenges here that were not being addressed. Okay, I'm gonna ask a little bit offbeat question, and you know me, so I think I can ask you an offbeat question. How would you, compare and contrast your experience with somebody who became for a while a little bit of a poster child for at one time was considered to be quote unquote cross-dressing or whatever and that was Ed Wood the actor mm -hmm. and the film director and stuff like that and they made the movie about his life how would you compare and contrast that because I think that's what a lot of people think when they think about uh, well, the idea of transsexualism the whole the whole presentation of this topic has been biased from the start. Uh, as a result, I feel like our people have been, um, in a sense, hijacked for other people's agendas, and that's still going on to this day. And it's unfortunate because not only did we have to uh, address our own individual life situations, but we were dealing with culture wars at the same time. And those culture wars have on only increased in intensity as time has gone by. So the talk shows uh, literally uh, fed on us, uh, in my mind. What they did is they uh, promoted us into a, a kind of a shock value, surefire rating scheme. And I don't think that was appropriate. I don't think I can't think of any other personal issue, or whether it was mental or physical, that would have been handled in that particular way. And so, um, things, films like Ed Wood, uh, you know, Tu Wong Fu, Thanks for you know everything, yeah. Julie Newmar. Some of these are just entertainment, and of course, our lives are lived. They're not entertainment. Um, if you'll notice the cover of my book, it has uh, the the what I did was I wanted to express the division between lightness and darkness. Mm. And one of the things I discovered was that in writing the book, I was going through this process of having to confront a life and make a statement about it. And what I noticed is that it was very hard for me to write a book like this because it was personal. When I write fiction, I have no problems. It's easy. I just listen to the characters talk, and they, they write for me. But when I had to be the subject and I had to write about me or things that I was very close to, it was so painful that it took me a long, long time to write this book. I wrote it over a period of four years. Then I put my first edition out. Then I withdrew it and rewrote the entire book and added mm. a third part. So all of this was designed to get closer to the truth. And what I found out was that I couldn't be either one direction or the other. It wasn't possible. I, I realized that conflict had become my ingrained sense of self. So that kind of explains, or can you explain some more than why you divided the book into three parts? 
Well, it started with only two parts, and the third part was added. Um, so if you think of it along a temporal perspective, we start with uh, t the topical essays, which explain uh, they're very short, and they're designed to be pithy and right to the point. And I tried to ask all the questions that anyone had ever asked about being transsexual. Then the middle part was uh, autobiography, but told in significant episodic pieces from my life rather than a continuous storyline. And then the third part was the final essays, which were where are we going now as a community and where am I going now at this particular stage of my life? Because um, if you think about life, it could be divided into four quadrants. Mm -hmm. And the type of decisions you'll make in a latter day part of your life are not the same decisions or the same needs that you would meet at another part of your life where you had an entirely different mission. If you think about it, your first 20 years are spent learning. Your second uh, thing is usually where you're really establishing your career. Your third years are when you're a, a mentor to others. And then your fourth years are retirement and reflection. And if you're lucky, you get maybe even 20 more at the very end where you're literally moving into either an afterlife, if you believe in, in uh, religion, or, uh, or if nothing else, you're, you have become a kind of an oracle of the ages at that point. Well, since you mentioned religion, how do you, how do you think religion has helped or hurt the whole uh, subject matter, I guess? Well, religion is another one of these areas where we have been called upon to, um, to answer for more than what we are. We're, we're asked to be cultural icons. We're asked to be religious scapegoats. We're asked to be people that are so far beyond what our actual power are. Uh, for instance, we're estimated to be 0.6% of the US population, but still about 1,300,000 people. That's a lot of people. Um, and these are people that are living lives just like everybody else, and they want to walk out into the world and not be made fun of, not be victims of violence, not be victims of prejudice. And unfortunately, even our friends sometimes hurt us. And they hurt us by uh, drafting us into conversations that we're really not a part of. For instance, one of the terms that's uh, thrown about now is gender ideology. The idea being that gender is a completely relative uh, situation and that everybody could choose to be transgender or transsexual. And that's, in fact, not the case. No transsexual has ever put themselves through what we go through if we didn't think that gender mattered. If we thought it was completely relative, it would have been easier to stay where we were, but we weren't. So it kind of comes up with this next question was the idea of, <coughs> notice there's been a big discussion, discussion on the World Wide Web about transsexual versus transgender. Um, since you've lived through some of these cultural changes over the years, mm -hmm. Can you kind of explain the evolution of the terms and what they kind of mean to you? This is the perfect question and the most important one I could answer today, which is the idea that words are not magic. And unfortunately, today we've gotten into the, the, the idea that we can use rhetoric that says certain things are fake and then that we completely discount them by simply applying a name to them. It's fake news. Oh, well, then it must be inaccurate. And why is it fake news? Have you proven this? No, we've just said it's fake news. And similarly, uh, the term transsexual was, in, was invented by Dr. Harry Benjamin in 1966. That was the prevalent term for people like myself all through those years. Transgender at that time was for people who lived as female but did zero bodily changes, no hormones, no surgeries, no nothing. Now transgender is the all-inclusive term for any gender variability, regardless of whether you're transsexual or not. So transgender is the big term, transsexual is the specific term. Transsexuals were the people that sought medical intervention so that our lives were easier and we felt less of the pain of being in the wrong gender. So that's, um, that's the difference. Now, cross-dressers and drag queens are two other things that come up. 
Cross-dressers are usually heterosexual. Cross-dressers are people like Ed Wood. Um, they are people that are, uh, it, it simply brings a sense of gender relief, but that's it. Uh, drag queens are, is kind of a derogatory term. Drag queens apply to people that are usually gay and are usually doing this pr primarily for entertainment or just within drag culture, which is uh, bigger than just what you would do on stage, but it's, it's cer certainly not the deepest expression of who they are, whereas transsexuals, it's, in, it's rooted inside. W would you say also, in each one of these groups, to a certain extent, there may be either some conscious or unconscious stereotype that you're supposed to act a certain way if you take a certain title? Well, this is where gender is, is also becoming fluid because one of the new terms is called non-binary. And non-binary is where you uh, quarrel with the idea that gender is a valid designation in the first place. That gender is oppressive no matter whether you're transsexual or whether you're absolutely straight or whatever. And that's why everybody has some issues with being a gendered person in society because of the expectations. And where do these expectations and imperatives come from? I got 30 years in law enforcement <coughs> and one of the unfortunate byproduct of this whole thing is we had to deal with was, okay, if I arrest somebody and we're going to have somebody search somebody, we had to be careful that we tried to use the same people with the same anatomy to do the searching and stuff because otherwise somebody would scream and yell at, you know, hey, right. you're molesting me. Right. And so that's causing even more of a problem now, especially in, in the prison setting and stuff like this, because unfortunately, everybody in every group has those people that wind up, unfortunately, making a mistake or doing something wrong and winding up, you know, incarcerated. Mm -hmm. So I guess the, the, the whole thing about then is how, in your opinion, having lived it, how would you want that kind of subject to be dealt with? Well, see, because we do live in a gendered society, and we also deal in a society that respects personal privacy and bodily integrity. Right. These things come up whenever there's touch involved, and they come up, obviously, in the restroom situation. The restroom situation has almost co-opted our entire existence, and it's really mm -hmm. absurd if you think about it. Thank goodness we're moving to the idea of just gender-neutral bathrooms. But unfortunately, that's become the center point. That, that and the, the, the sports issue about whether people have an advantage in women's sports because of testosterone. Um, it's beyond the scope of this book to go into all of these different details, but once again, this proves that we have other narratives that are trying to draw us away from the center of transgender lives, which is simply surviving in this world. So to a certain extent, I guess, then we can get to the idea that there does seem to be a certain level of lack of discourse on a halfway uh, reasonable way. In other words, everybody seems to be trying to stake out a certain side or a certain part. I mean, would you kind of agree, agree to that that's causing some of the problems? It's, it's, it's a lot of it is, is what you might call social immaturity. Um, um, there have been books that have been written on the idea of what happens with what are called category errors. Category errors happen when we have strict categories and then we have a new experience that doesn't fit into any of the little boxes that we've had. And rather than think about the problem creatively or with compassion, what happens instead is that people try to say, here, are you, are you, are you here or are you there? And then stuff experiences that cannot be addressed by that category into that little box. And I think that that has it wouldn't matter if it was just a, a purely a, a thing in people's ideas or something mm -hmm. that people can talk about. The existential aspect of being transgender can never be underplayed because that's what the pain is. The pain is feeling wrong all the time. And everywhere you look, you're being reflected back a world that you see as upside down because it doesn't square with your inner experience. So it, so it becomes like a form of dysphoria. It is, and that's why the only term that has been retained by the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual has been gender dysphoria. 
<coughs> uh, which involves the question of what is dysphoria? Does that mean just unhappiness? Does that mean just you're just kind of sad? No. Uh, it's a sense of complete wrongness. It's hard to explain except if you tried to imagine it the other way. If you said, what if you had to live in a completely alien gender? Would you feel comfortable with that? And what if every aspect of your life from marriage to sexual partner choice was determined based on that and you felt wrong from day one till the day you died? Now you say, well, um, many people will say, well, what about late in life transsexuals that only come out and surprise everyone at their 40s? Well, most of those people have felt like this for a long, long, long time. But what happens is that they finally were able to fit this into their life, or finally accept the cost of embracing this mm -hmm. particular truth. Um, it's not pleasant, and it's socially disruptive when this happens. It's easier if you're someone like me that transitioned early. So, but even I am not like as, as, as young as people are happening now. You're mm -hmm. seeing this all the time. It's being addressed early enough before, like for instance, voices don't change. You can't shorten vocal cords. Even the surgeries are very dangerous to do something like that, my understanding is. So you're, you're, you're kind of stuck with what you've got. Your, your timber is never going to be perfect. And we do with uh, voices one of the ways that we identify people. And mm. the reason that we identify them is that we put them in little boxes. Uh, the newer generation are, is much less gender conscious, I think, than we still have You know, people who want to look very pretty or very buff. But essentially, um, people have a lot of freedom that they didn't used to have. I don't know where we are with our time, but I'd like to talk a little about the book itself. When I, when I wrote the book, I wrote it to try to deal with the most intimate possible level of experience. And I, I, started, I started it with this thought here. It, it has a chapter called Loomings that I, I cribbed from Moby Dick, no. you know, <laughs> <laughs> as his first chapter. But I said, David Copperfield begins his account of his life by saying words such as these, whether I shall be the hero of my own history or whether that place shall be reserved for another, I cannot say. To an extent, every transsexual is a hero of his or her own story for the simple reason that f the function of the hero in literature is to encounter a set of challenges which lead to either insight and to victory or to downfall and defeat. To write a book like this, one is to, one is I'm sorry, to write a book like this one is to emerge out of silence and let other people enter the private zones of my life. But that is not why I hesitate in letting this book go out into the world. My hesitations are due to my fear that for all my diva pretensions, I do not really want to take on the fearful responsibility of shifting the constellation of the opinions of others in what may prove to be the wrong direction. I would much prefer that my mistakes be confined within the shallow perimeters of my own life. It isn't easy to be transsexual. I feel at times like the character of, uh, character of Ali in my favorite movie, Lawrence of Arabia, pointing out across the great Nefu desert, which the small band of Arab revolutionaries hope to be able to cross in order to attack the Turkish port held of Aqaba from the landward side. Lawrence asks how much of the desert there is, and Ali says that only God knows, but that after a certain number of days, the camels will start to die, and when they die, the men will begin to perish as well. It is a stern moment in the film. There's still time to turn back and to, dev to devise another plan. But Lawrence answers by saying that if time is so pressing, then there is no time to waste, and the tiny party sets off into the desert. Lawrence may have been impetuous or foolish, but there is always something majestic in displaying so much will on a chaotic quest. Lawrence insists that nothing is written but what is written inside our own heads. Transsexuals think the same way. So this explains that to even write a book like this was really, really hard. And to tell the truth even to myself was really, really hard. But what I finally came up with after the, the long period of five years it took me to write it was, I think, a very authentic witness to our experience, even if it's only told through one person. So I hope people uh, will have enjoyed our talk today. And um, 
and also will have enjoyed um, hearing that such a book, which I think fills in some gaps that existed in transgender literature, is there. Um, I wish I had time to write a lot of books that would be just entertainment, but I, I started writing late in life, and I, I found myself running out of time, so every book that I've written is meant to fill a certain function. Mm -hmm. It's, um, it's, and this, this one was to tell the truth on a topic that affects, as I said, one, one, you know, over a million people. That's a lot of people, and the ripple effects into other families and other things is huge. And the fact that we're constantly in the public eye, even if we don't necessarily want to be, again, makes it very topical and makes it essential that some of this word get out there. But by telling it in a conflicted way, rather than being a protagonist to saying, okay, this is the way it should be, or this mm. is the way it should be, I thought I had done justice to virtually every position in the book. And some of the essays contradicted themselves. And, and I remembered Walt Whitman's famous statement and said, do I contradict myself? Very well, I contradict myself. And I always thought that was a very honest statement. I think too much of today's rhetoric is designed to say there's one way and only this way. And I think it's, it's, it's doing damage to us as a people. Is there any other message from the book that you'd like to emphasize to the BCAT audience? Well, I think I've expressed what I hoped I could de deal with today. If I can have just a second, I'll read you a oh, little bit. Oh, of course you can have a second. <laughs> well, I started the thing with the idea, um, I, uh, with a poem. And I'll read you a little of that. It's called Incantation, and uh, we'll let it speak for itself. Who is Sheila? Would you know? Scarlet trollop, virgin snow. Mighty goddess, or much less? Hear me now as I confess. I'm a phantom of the night, ivy, bay, and fairy sprite. By the shadows of the moon, shades of solstice coming soon. Mistletoe and doleful rue, cauldron, broom, and witch's brew. These I fashion, dark or fair, long-nailed hands and waving hair. In the clearing work my charms, wand and grimoire do no harms. Cast the spell and speak it low, cause the crops to seed and grow. Harvest maidens, wan and sere, leave your homes and meet me here. Form the circle round the fire. Dance the dreams of heart's desire. Fear my eye, forswear my touch. Love me, but not overmuch. Works my magic, force my will. Freeze your soul and hold you still. Over meadow, sage and thorn, from the place was I, where I was born. Mountain spring or barren land, make you pause and understand who I am and where I've been. Dancing in the spiral spin, Words from siren mouths a kiss, tell you this and only this, guess you must, just what may be, who I am by night's dark sea, where I vanish or appear, dwells my spirit far or near. Weave by moonlight in the glen, incantations uttered then, all around me finds its voice, make decisions, make their choice, form behind me in a line, make your wish the same as mine. Heal my pain and dry my tears through my long sequestered years. I am Sheila, listen all. Velvet goddess lifts her pall, sings her desolation blues, shares her discontented views. Diamond, emerald, sapphire light, ride the winds this winter night. Work my magic book and bell, candle bless this Sheila spell. With that excellent poem, we would like to really thank you for being here today for our broadcast. People might be wondering how to get my book. It is a very personal book, so in some respects I, I feel like it's a dialogue with individual people that would read it. The best way, I think, to do this is to uh, just send it to my email and I can explain to people how they can order the book. Um, the, the way to do that would be Sheila, that's S-H-E-I-L-A, underscore in, underscore Paul's bow at yahoo.com. And we'll put that on our screen. That would be lovely. This. Thank you, Mark. Well, thank you very much. Um, this is going to conclude this broadcast of our nice little show that we do every week. And once again, if it wasn't for all of the effort of our BCAT staff, all the extra work they do, 
we wouldn't be here. And Claw is probably going to invite you back whenever you get around to uh, writing one of your other books. Kitsap Literary Artists and Writers, Bremerton Kitsap Access Television Broadcast can be seen every Saturday at 6 p.m. on Wave Cable Channel 3 and Comcast Channel 12. You can also watch live streaming on bcat.com. They will also be viewed Wednesday morning at 9 a.m. Access television shows are also available, like I said before, via streaming on the internet at bcat.com. Also, uh, Blue Forge Group helps us post it on YouTube, and if you check for Claw and Blue Forge Group, you can find uh, all of our shows in the last three years. Anyone interested in creating similar content, please contact the BCAT manager, John Rausch. I would like to really thank you once again, and I also would like to thank all of the BCAT audience for f tuning in every single week when we do this. In addition, Kitsap Literary Artists and Writers meet the first and third Wednesdays of every month at Spiro's Pizza on Kitsap Way in Bremerton, Washington. We exist as a group to help all creators distribute their works and art to the public. Everyone is welcome at our meetings. You can find us on Facebook and also on our meetup page, where we also list venues we use to promote our books and other items. I also host an affiliated Kitsap Filmmakers Group, which meets the second Tuesday of every month at the Family Pancake House on Wheaton Way in Bremerton, Washington. If you like film, come on down. So that is this. That is it for this broadcast of the Kitsap Literary Artist and Writers Author Show. Broadcast from Bremerton Kitsap Access Television. Good day.